What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Eastern Current. Excited about tonight's show, as always. We've got a great guest that I will introduce here in a second. Before we get too deep into it, I want to share with y'all our sponsors of the podcast. Starting out with J&J Boat Detailing, full-service boat detailing. They'll come to you, uh, detail your boat in your driveway, in your garage, maybe not in your garage, but in your driveway, at your boat slip, on the lift. Uh, They have a full-service dive team as well that can go under... The boat, while it's in the water, and, and clean the whole bottom, get all the barnacles off, get all the growth off, and, and man, I've had them detailing my boats. They're perfect, cleaner than I could ever get on myself with a really, really good price. Uh, if you use the code EC2022, you'll get 10% off your first uh, boat detail, the detailing of your boat, and uh, I promise that you will be happy with it. They're great guys, extremely professional business, and uh, just always been super happy. Uh, working with them. And then our next is TNL Table Company. They've built a lot of custom wood stuff for my wife and I, this dining room table that I'm sitting at. Um, an awesome new podcast table that's going to go in the new studio when we get it all set up here. Um, will probably be this fall with how busy things are, but we'll have the new podcast studio up and going. Excited about that. But any type of custom woodwork you need, cabinets. We just had a new mantle built by uh, buy them and um, tables, really anything you need. They're, they're, they can really do incredible work, any type of custom woodworking. So um, great people over there. I also wanted to give a shout out to, I've got the shirt on, which is reminding me tonight, but Boise Bone Company, um, some awesome dudes out in Idaho that uh, do a lot of shed hunting with their dogs and they've turned it into a business and they're taking all the elk antlers and mule deer antlers and cutting them and shaving them down and making awesome dog chews, which both my dogs love. And, and they, uh, I can give them those those antler shoes and they'll sit there, sit still on the couch for hours chewing on them. So go check out Boise Bone Company, uh, just an awesome company out in Idaho and, and really stoked on what they're doing. Um, but with that being said, going to go ahead and bring on our special guest, Mr. Joe. What's going on, man? How's it going, man? Oh, pretty good. Pretty good. I'm uh, I'm excited to have you on. Excited to talk about some, some fishing up north. And it's a fish that we're all, I feel like everyone loves, which is a striper. Yeah, man, it's, uh, the season's just getting going here on the Cape. Um, you know, I'm up here in Massachusetts. My, uh, I'm always dreaming of redfish, which you have down in <laughs> That's one of my favorite fish to catch. But, uh, but I am really lucky to have stripers here in, uh, in New England and, uh, I'm stoked for the season. Definitely, man. I think it's, uh, it's, it's super funny how the grass is always greener. If you've got yeah. redfish and whatnot, you're thinking of stripers. If you've got tarpon, you're thinking of, I don't know, exactly. you always want to do what's not right at your, right. Right at your fingertips. So it's, uh, but it is, it is always nice and refreshing to step back and take a deep breath and realize kind of what you've got, especially like you and I live right near the water. It's easy for us to go fish every day. And so, and I I feel so bad for the people that are two, three hours inland and you know, they got really nothing at their fingertips, but, um, so kind of give us your backstory. Tell us how you grew up, uh, as far as your fishing life goes and how it's brought you to where you are today and kind of what you're doing now. Yeah. So, um, I actually grew up in Atlanta, Georgia and, uh, I did a lot of, uh, largemouth fishing down there. Not on the fly. I, I didn't start fly fishing until just before college, but um, I've been a couple times, but really didn't dive into it until college. But I spent I spent every summer here on the Cape. Uh, my grandparents had a place, and um, it was I had always just dreamed of going back to the Cape every summer because the fish are bigger. It's the ocean, you know. It's just it's never ending. Um, and so yeah, after college, I I decided to move here and. Um, I, you know, after I'd been here a couple years, I, I spent some time out west in um, Oregon, Idaho, and Colorado doing the uh, the fisheries biology thing. That's what I studied in, in college. Nice. But um, I have pretty much decided that uh, Massachusetts or East Coast striper country is where I want to end up. Um, and so here I am. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to, to keep doing it every year. That's super cool, man. I, I love how like different people are drawn to different fisheries like we can all bond i talked about this in the last podcast but we can all bond over the similar love of fishing and be fishing every day but be doing stuff completely differently Uh, and sometimes not even that far apart you know like even within north carolina or within massachusetts you can you know someone can fish every day and make a whole living and life around fishing and be doing something completely different than yourself which is pretty cool yeah pretty pretty cool so what are some of the main 
types of fish that are targeted up there besides striper? Kind of, I know here you've got people that kind of a lot of people. A lot of people will fish for a little bit of everything, but then you've got like your clicks and your types of people that are like tuna guys or tarpon people or redfish people. What are what are some of the the fisheries up there that you feel are you know notable? I'd say um, as far as non like big game goes, um, the the big ones are striped bass, bluefish, black sea bass, and fluke, um, and tatog. Yeah. Uh, so and and we, you're talking about like clicks a little bit like, they're the bottom fishing crew is is kind of dedicated to their thing. You know yeah. what I mean? They they love. Um, jigging for for black sea bass and tog and fluke, and um, and those fish just taste so good. You right, know, I, right. I don't blame. Them. I love doing it every now and then. Um, and then your um, your striped bass and bluefish guys are uh, you know it's it's cool because it's pretty diverse. On the Cape, we have a lot of opportunities for shore fishing. Um, there's so much public water that you know all the beaches, all the inlets, and um, and the shape of Cape Cod is really cool. Because really, it's almost like a miniature, uh, like Florida Panhandle. So if, if the wind's blow in hard one direction, and it's too bad to cast. Just go to the go to the north side, go to the east side, go to the west side. You know, um, and uh, but yeah, I'd say you know striped bass gets going first, then bluefish come up, and um, and the stripers kind of move around. You know, um, and then late late summer, early fall, uh, recreational tuna usually come around nice so we've got our um you know if you've got a boat that's worthy of just going out on uh past the backside beaches um they're just they're big albies you know right right baby bluefin tuna so and then of course in in september we get our albies um nothing like the north carolina albies but they're they're a lot of fun great fish for a fly rod they eat tiny stuff so easy to throw um, with a fly rod hard exactly. to throw with a spin rod <laughs> yeah exactly yeah that's cool. Um, th- man, I love what you were saying about the, and I, I felt that when I was up in Cape Cod this winter, sea duck hunting, because we had like a different wind direction every day, it's, it felt like. Yeah. And even in the middle yeah. of the winter, when like you feel like a prominent wind would be out of the north or at least northwest or northeast. Uh, but there's so many little hooks and little coves and yep. capes and there, whatever. I mean, every place has a different term for each type of inshore estuary or whatnot. But, um, it was really cool to be able to hide from the wind, and I was jealous of that as far as um, thinking about fishing as well in the summer. And, man, just such beautiful, beautiful pieces of water up there. Really, really cool. Yeah. I didn't know what to expect, what I was going to see up there. But what was scary is, like, as far as a boat goes, is you'd be in areas, like, full of sand, and there'd just be, like, a massive rock somewhere. Like, you yep. have, really have to. And there's, no, they're not marked, and... Um, no. We don't have that down here. I mean, there's some stuff to hit, but right. not just random rocks that make no sense why they're there. At least sandbars make sense. <laughs> Oyster bars make sense. Like, yeah. okay, that I know why they're there, but like a big rock in the middle of nowhere, to, at least to me, it makes yeah, no yeah. sense. No, it, it catches me by, by surprise all the time, unfortunately. So what uh, um, what kind of fishing do you find yourself doing most up there as far as um, when you've got free time to go out and, and, and target fish? I, I just love fly fishing, so um, I um, we've, we've got a pretty unique, like we were talking about the shape of Cape Cod, um, it, it's a really easy place to target fish on the fly because of your wind directions and because, because you always have options for, for getting closer to fish, yeah. you know, and that's the, that's the greatest uh, limiting factor with a fly rod is distance, usually. Um, Definitely. And um, so, yeah, I'm 95% of the time I'm fly fishing. Um, when I'm, you know, when albies are being really picky, I'll go to the dark side when, you know, bluefin to little schoolie bluefin tuna are around, I'll absolutely, you know, pick up a spin rod. Um, and I, uh, and, and if I'm bottom fishing, you know, I love black sea bass and, and, um, fluke. And, uh, when I'm fishing for meat, I just want to get meat in the cooler. Yeah, you know, definitely. Um, definitely. Uh, one of the fish that I've started fishing for the past couple of years that y'all have a bunch of up there is the tog. I like to go out there in the yeah. winter and target them they're fun to catch because they're a little tricky you get deep yeah. like feeling the bite on crabs and and getting the hook set but man those mm-hmm. fish are very delicious and and we yeah. really only have them in like the winter we're kind of in a weird in a cool area being in like north carolina where we have 
like a mixture of like what the North sees, like a little bit of what people up the, in the Northeast see. And then we see some of the stuff like that, that you get down in Florida. So it's like this cool yeah. in between, um, which still even having that, you're always like the grass is, I wish I was in Florida. I wish I had tarpon and snook and bonefish all the time, but I mean, right. leave it to fishermen to like always complain about their fishery yeah. and then the, whatever the weather's doing. Right. Right. So, right. Well, what, so do you work in, uh, in the goose hummock tackle shop? I do. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. I'm a manager there and, um, I'm also their, their, uh, their fly fishing guide. Awesome. So I take, I take people on Brewster flats mostly. Um, cause it's, uh, it Brewster flats. It's the, it's the largest, uh, tidal flat in North America, uh, which is really cool. So, you know, obviously Florida has bigger flats. They're not necessarily tidal. So yeah. this is, they're, they're dry at low tide and they're, they're wet at, at high tide. Dang, that's um, so cool. But yeah, it's really cool. And, um, it's, it's really cool. Just like, targeting stripers in such a unique environment like I'll, most of the time i treat them like bonefish and permit you know i'm throwing crabs and shrimp um and that's the that's the best way to fool the, the, the pickiest ones yeah definitely is that is there a lot of people that travel up to cape cod to fly fish now oh, yeah. is it growing quite a bit the fly fishing culture yeah. up there along with i yeah, guess everywhere great. in the country that's super yeah cool. yeah definitely so we've got an annual uh tournament the cheeky fishing tur- fly fishing tournament yeah i've seen um, that is that through the uh, shop uh, or just in Cape Cod? Somewhere. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, it's just in Cape Cod. Um, yeah, we're a sponsor of it, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool because uh, a lot of people come from, you know, Germany, Denmark, like all over Europe and, and um, all over the south to, to come fish this tournament and, um, and get, you know, and it's, it's really, it's positioned when the, the stripers first arrive here in the spring. So um, the, anyway, the nicer fish, but um, but yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. That's super cool. I might have to make it up there to try to fish that sometime. Yeah. So one question I get as a guide here all the time is, like people are they they might be booking a redfish trip. I do a lot of fly fishing as well. I would say majority of fly fishing, um, and people always want to know where to go wade here. And I really tell them I'm like we just really don't have any options. Like unless there's a flood tide while they're here and, and maybe they can go walk out in some grass that's connected to the backside of an island. But we really yeah. don't have many options. But that's one thing when I was thinking about and, and I'm I am i am so excited about this podcast just because I had so many questions based off of what I saw when I was up there. Yeah. Um, but so many areas where it looked super fishy where you could just park the truck and maybe just walk out on a beach. Is that productive there? Like is everything pr- – I mean I, here it seems like 95% of the fish live in like 5% of the water. Is, is that yeah. the same case up there or if it's like a fishy looking spot, can you park the truck and usually go get into some stripers? No, you can – like for most of the summer, you can usually park your truck and go get into some stripers. Wow. They might not all be the biggest fish. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean the most of the guys I work with are, are primarily uh, surf fishermen, so – but they're they get bigger stripers than a lot of the boat guys do just because they're they're constantly dialed into their you know environment so that and there there's so many fish that that spend most of their time like 20 yards from the from the beach which is really that's nice cool. um, nice for us fly guys too definitely um, that's awesome are, are you yeah. are those fish that are staying close to the beach are they on more like are you finding them on the protected flats or are you finding them out in the breakers and the surf or a little bit of both they're in the wash too. Okay. Um, yeah, a lot of times it's kind of crazy fishing up like the backside beaches like Nosset and Race Point because you on sunny days um, you can see them running from seals, you know, and they'll still eat your fire for fun. Running um, away from the seal when you're, but they're 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 yeah yeah we, we have a lot of seals that like to eat them. That's crazy. Um, but they're um, the, yeah they cruise really close to shore yeah. and because that's where a lot of our bait fish you know yeah, we have yeah. sand eels. A lot of crabs, silver sides, peanut bunker, um, and then big bunker, you know, uh, Manhattan. Um, and then in the springtime, herring. Nice. That's a lot of, nice. That's a lot of what they do. Is that the river herring that, w- that you hear called? I, I, maybe you don't know. I, God, yeah. it seems like everywhere you go, bait fish have like 10 different names in different areas. But um, I know, man. Manhattan, bunker. Pogies. <laughs> yeah, we call – I got made yeah, fun of the other day yeah, because yeah. I, I got made fun of the other day because I called – uh, called Pogies Bunker, and someone was like, "Where are you from?" Yeah. <laughs> like making fun of me for calling him Bunker. Uh, 
But yeah, apparently that was one of the the dying reason, or one of the reasons that our striper fishery died so hard in the southeastern part of North Carolina was the overfishing of the river herring. So the yeah the, the reason that they were coming up in the rivers like the main food source, so the fish started leaving. But um, I've heard stories, old you know, old tales of you're not allowed to fish river herring in some of these rivers when these mm-hmm. fish are moving up to spawn in them anymore. But I've heard stories yeah. of guides that that will cast net a couple river herring and you can almost guarantee like they won't even fish it on the bottom they'll just pitch a they'll be in like heavy current in a river pitch a uh, river herring on a circle hook and just let it free yep. swim and they're going to catch a 20 30 pound striper on it oh so, yeah yeah which is pretty cool is that if you're going to bait fish for stripers up there is river herring the, the bait to have yeah yeah you're not really allowed to up here um but yeah, a lot of people live line bunker. Um, gotcha. A lot of people live line pearl. Um, so you know, a little farther the, the fish that are a little farther offshore, they eat a lot of mackerel and squid. Gotcha. Um, but you know, as far as bait fishing goes, um, mackerel and bunker are the are the two, and and sand eels. You know, we have some yeah, sand eels right. that get perfect. Um, that, that's cool. They they die if you kind of look at them the wrong way, you know. But um, <laughs> but yeah, mackerel's really good live bait, and and so is bunker. That's cool. Um, it's crazy to think of striper being offshore and eating squid and mackerel. Like it's yeah. just, I'm like, that's oh, not yeah. the same fish that we have here. Cause I'm sure you <laughs> being from Atlanta, we're familiar with this, a type of striper down there too, like a lake, lake stripers and whatnot, if you did that. And they're just such a different animal than, than the stripers up, up yeah. north. Uh, yeah, it was crazy. One of the, for a long time when I was growing up, one of the biggest fish that I had caught was a freshwater striper that was stocked in Lake Lanier gotcha. in Georgia. I'm like that's that's super weird. You know, I was I was live lining like a yellow perch or something. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and then yeah, coming up coming up to the Cape, they're they're the same fish basically. We just we just stock them in the river and lake down there. Right. Exactly. So you were talking about kind of how you target these fish. Like, what is if you've got perfect conditions and you're going to go out? Like, it seems like there's a lot of ways ways to catch striper up there. What what's kind of your go to? Like, if you can have it your way, how are you going to be catching these fish? My go-to is crab flies on the flats. That's um, I always there even when I'm wading the flats and I see a ton of sand eels and little bait fish out there. There's I always catch my biggest fish when I switch to a crustacean fly, like a shrimp or a, or a crab. Yeah. Um, and I haven't really pegged down the, a reason why, but I'm thinking like they're they're an easy meal, even though it's a pretty small fly. Um, like a, any bait fish is going to run from a striper and they know that, you know, but a crab is, is going to post up and be like back up, you know, and it's, it's just an easy meal for them. Yeah, definitely. I like, I like that thought process there. Yeah. And make it um, easy for them. It's like they're snacking on them, you know, and it, they're not going to run. And that's yeah. why, that's why they, they eat them. Do y'all see many crabs and shrimp nat- naturally up there? Little yeah. small crabs and shrimp. Do you know what kind of crabs and shrimp they are? Yeah, a lot of calico crabs and okay. those um, those Japanese green crabs that are invasive. But the calicos, I believe, are native. Okay. Uh, are the calicos the ones that like have little dots all over the shell? They're like tan with little dots on them. Yeah, yeah, they're mostly okay. tan, and reddish. Yeah. That's sweet. Yeah, I've heard all about these green crabs that are invasive. Uh, those are I've heard really good tog bait, right? Yes, they are. I yeah. talked to someone. I mean, we who, love them. Yeah. We love them because we just you know set traps for them up here and. Are and they good to eat as well? Uh, I don't think so. No one eats them. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Well, that, that's sweet. That it's funny how something invasive can turn around and be yeah. be helpful sometimes. Is yeah. there any? This is just me asking questions because I have no clue. Is there any downfall of those crabs having those green crabs around? Does it hurt anything? I I couldn't tell you that. Um, gotcha. I um, yeah, other than just you know eating algae and plankton, I I wouldn't I wouldn't have any opinion on them. But they're just kind of everywhere, you yeah. know. Yeah. And uh, and kind of replacing the habitat of blue crabs, which we've we've had forever, you know. But um, but yeah, we still have a healthy blue crab population. So nice. Um, do y'all have stone crabs up there as well? We I don't think we do. Okay. I don't know. Well, actually, yeah, that wouldn't make sense because always before I knew, uh, they they have stone crabs down in the keys, so it wouldn't make sense for them to yeah. be up there. I think they're warmer water. Yeah. But for right. some reason, I always thought. When I was younger, as a kid, a stone crab would be more of a northern crab. I was just thinking like rocks, rocky beaches, yeah. northern fish, but I guess they're more coral-based and, and warm water. 
Um, well, that's that's cool. What kind of shrimp do y'all have? Do y'all have a, a diverse shrimp population up there? Or, I'm always curious uh, about the different types of bait fish and, and what fish are feeding on in different areas. Yeah, not really. Most of what I see is grass shrimp. Sweet. Um, they're they're really small. You know, I mean, you'll, you'll get them like three inches or so, the big ones, but uh, but most of them are like one inch. Yeah. And they're almost transparent. You know. Oh, those, is that a summertime thing to have the grass shrimp? Yeah, 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 definitely a summertime. That's kind of like us as well. That's cool. I'm sure there are two different types of grass shrimp, but our shrimp, the ones that the redfish are eating right now too, we call them grass shrimp. So yeah. hey, I would love to, to know if they were the same one, but it, I, I'm sure yeah. be, we'd have to lay them side by side. I'll mail you one of your of ours and you yeah. mail me one of yours and we'll, we'll check them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so do you do much fly time as far as? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Cool. Um, I, didn't for, I didn't for a long time, especially when I was out west like doing the trout thing because I was – I was just like, man, these are size 22 hooks or it's like five millimeters. You know, I'm not, I'm not messing with that. But, um, but I really love tying crabs and big bait fish, um, and, and some squid flies. So we have, you know, when we, when we fish Monomoy rips, which is just east of, uh, of Chatham, uh, a little bit Southeast of Chatham, the squid is pretty much the primary, primary bait of, of the big stripers there. Wow. And so it's a really easy fly to tie. It's just a bunch. You could just use a bunch of like EP fiber or um, marabou, orange and pink, and put a big old eyeball on it. You know. Yeah. I've uh, seen but some crabs of are fun. Flies, they're cool. because, yeah, yeah. Crabs are fun because they're also pretty easy to tie, and they're it's like tying a big bug. Yeah. Do you have a specific? Do you have like a custom pattern that you're tying? The one thing about a lot of the redfish true crab patterns that I have is I'm stripping so much on a redfish yeah. and the crab doesn't swim great. So I've kind of, I've moved to like those like one arm crabs, like the strong arm crabs and whatnot. I'll fish those. It's pretty much like a quan with like a, a claw tail because right. it strips a little bit better. Is there a pattern that you find yourself at fishing more? Yeah, yeah. I don't have like a, an exclusive uh, pattern, but I've got kind of variations of the, the flexo crabs. Okay, sweet. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's it's uh, like Blaine Chocolate's uh, fish body tubing. You can flex it into a bunch of different shapes. And um, I really I really like tying with that because it's easy to tie shrimp. It's easy to put a big old dumbbell eye in the middle of it if you want to get something heavy. Yeah. Um, and speaking of, like, you know, stripping them fast – I, uh, what a lot of the guys do here is they actually, you, even on Brewster flats, when you're fishing, you know, three feet of water, um, they use a full sinking line and wow. a big, heavy crab. So when, and you basically strip really fast, let it sit for three full seconds, strip really fast and, and repeat, um, and, uh, and, and kick up a little, a little puff of sand, yeah, you yeah. know, but letting it sit is when a lot of those fish will eat. Because they're probably used to coming and picking crabs up off the bottom of their yeah. skin still. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's and cool. And especially like the ones where when they are sitting down, the arms are kind of just like up. Because they're like, oh, it's it's a thing in a defensive position. Right, right. Um, a cool thing about that, that material that you've tied those flies out of, we were we found some areas. We, we have lots of black drum here in North Carolina. Yeah. But not often are they like sight fishable. But we've kind of over the years located some areas where you can bump into them and have found a couple flats that they get on pretty heavily. And they're just really hard to get to eat artificial. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and obviously an artificial on spin, very hard. But even a fly, it's hard to get them to eat a fly. Come up yeah. and look at it, a lot like a sheep said. Come up and swim up to it and check it out and then kind of swim away from it. I'm interested. And one day I had one of those um, flexo, I forget what the, that, is it the flexo crab material, whatever it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that mesh and I took some shrimp like some actual shrimp and used the crab like a cheese grater and filled that mesh up with some shrimp and threw that thing to the black drum and they were smoking it every single time it was cheating but it was like <laughs> a way that I could get this scent like really yeah. natural scent built into that crab fly which I thought was pretty cool some oh, fly yeah. fishermen would probably shoot me for it, but when I've th made a hundred casts of these black drum and can't get them to eat, and then I do that, and it's like every single one of them wants to smoke it. It was hard yeah. not to do. Um, yeah. But I do still have tried it with clients before, and some clients are like all about it. Some clients are like, no, I don't want to add any sense to my <laughs> fly. I'm like, all right, you're crazy. Yeah. But no, I break I break the rules all the time. I had a I had a guide in um, in Mexico for permit who um, he at the end of the trip it was it was really tough. We had only got like one or two permit. Um, at the end of the trip, he went to his trap and we went to this blue hole and he just crushed up a bunch of crabs and threw it down. 
and then we sunk a fly in there and sure enough you know that's awesome that's super cool it's good to save for the last day with your clients yeah especially for someone like me i'd be like let's just go back to the blue hole again (laughs) right right that's so cool um so as far as throwing a spin rod for these fish is there are you still trying to throw something that's crabby or shrimpy or are you switching over completely it's like a soft plastic or a top water anything like that yeah, you're kind of switching over completely, I would say, with the exception of some bucktails. Um, some of the bigger, you know, some of the heavier bucktails fished on the bottom can imitate a big uh, a big crab. But um, for, for the most part, uh, like the topwater guys, they're using docks, they're using anything you can walk the dog with. Um, and then SP minnows for uh, a lot of times for the surf um, okay. and just work really slow. It's something that is just walking back and forth, you know. Yeah, definitely. When bluefish show up, we a lot of us really get away from soft plastics because they'll just cut them in half. Yeah, they destroy them. Yeah. And y'all's bluefish are big, right? Yeah, we get some big bluefish here. That's cool. That's super cool. We we get a small little window of big bluefish here mm-hmm. some years. Some years we don't. I mean, you always hear for a couple people catching them. But as far as like, yeah. okay, they're, pretty, they're targetable. You can go out and target them. But then we have like this like annoying amount of like seven inch bluefish all summer so yeah. like you're throwing a jig and they're just destroying your jig and i love bluefish man they fight so hard they pull yeah. hard yeah um but i do not like seven inch bluefish especially the other day we were trying to bait fish and it was just man we couldn't keep a bait in the water because of these seven inch bluefish but then when if, if it's a 20 inch 18 inch bluefish man they're hard to beat they crush yeah. top water you can they jump. They, they jump. Yeah. They shake their head on the surface. They're super fun fish yep. to catch. So, is that something that you can kind of do mixed in, in together, stripers and bluefish? Are they hanging out and blitzing together? Yeah, all the time. That's cool. Uh, especially in the fall, you'll get um, you'll get some gator bluefish mixed in with stripers and and albies. You know, you can uh, easily do a what we call a Cape Cod hat trick. That's cool. Uh, and uh, but yes, and all summer on the Monomoy rips. Which uh, it's you know it's only fishable from a boat, but you, you'll get stripers and bluefish mixed in all the time, which is That's a lot cool. of fun. So, I've seen some pictures on your Instagram of albies like on foot. Is that a pretty common thing, being able to catch albacore from the bank? Yeah, yeah, a lot of guys do it here. Um, they come in really close, and um, it's like probably my favorite thing in the world is is uh, getting albies on the fly from shore. Yeah, that's super cool. Because I just feel like they fight different on a boat. You know, they've, uh, d- depending on where you are, but they, when you're on, sh- when you're from shore and you're in pretty shallow water, they only have one option. That's to run out you yeah. know, and not get those big screaming, screaming runs. Yeah. That's, um, that is super neat. Is that something that you can kind of dial in and really target as Albies from the beach? Or is that more so like your striper fishing and they start to blow up near you? And... No, like when Albies show up, I'm not really targeting stripers anymore. Gotcha. Um, Just Albies. I'm, I'm, for albies, yeah, um, and I don't really, I don't really fly fish from the beach for them that much. Yeah. I look for jetties that stick out because they they really like to push bait up against the rocks. Yeah, um, jetties and breakwaters is uh, is a really good place to get them. But but from spin on windy days, I'll take my spin rod too. You know, just light tackle um, and throw metals at them, and uh, and that's just to just to you know get them while I can. Definitely, because we have a pretty short albie season, like. They'll they'll show up in the end of August, and then if we get a really bad northeast storm in um, in October, they're just gone. Yeah. So. So are they coming from north of you? They're they're even north of you before that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think they do like a, a big kind of loop. I've looked at their like migration pattern before. Okay. Um, yeah, a big loop, and then then make their way south. Gotcha. That's so. So you don't see them in the spring necessarily. Or yeah, you don't see them in the spring. So we, we, in my, well, in our fishery, it seems like five years ago it was like only fall fishing. You'd mm-hmm. maybe bump into them offshore. I mean, you can you can catch an albie like if you're at the Gulf Stream, sixty miles off down here in trolling, you'll probably catch an albie. They just live out there all summer. Right, right. Um, but in short, it was like just a fall thing, and it seems like every year we're getting them like a little bit later and a little bit later in the spring. We're bumping into them closer to the beach. Like I had a buddy catch six on the fly rod yesterday here. Just six uh, albies. Six albies. 
on the fly yeah. rod in June, which is like, and then like a mile yeah. off the beach, which is pretty yeah. rare. Yeah, that's um, awesome. And I keep hearing more and more. I don't know what what the reasoning of that is. I mean, I do feel like I'm also seeing more and more small little glass baits and whatnot into mm-hmm. the spring. But yeah, we have a pretty our season though. I would say down here is like late August. You'll start to see them, and then through yeah. like middle of November, probably. Um, yeah, you'll you'll have them around. Um, but it's they're such fun fish, man. They're just really yeah. really cool. Just pulling drag. I can only imagine catching them from on foot would be incredible because like yeah. you said like catching any fish on foot's already i feel like cooler but then like an albie or any type of fish like a gt something that just rips off right drag right. would be just such a hoot to catch on foot yeah that's, that's really cool fun. um is and is that are you fishing like small little bait fish imitations clousers is that kind of what they're they're targeting yeah 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 i kind of stay away from clousers um and and you see so many guys like ripping their flies in because they think that you know fast a fast moving bait's going to get their attention but i honestly get most of my fish just dead drifting wow and so i like to fish like hyper realistic little bait fish that are just kind of drifting in the current um and are you throwing that one. into busting fish or are you just kind of blind casting that time, yeah okay yeah a cool. lot of times i'll throw it into a blitz and just kind of let it flutter maybe twitch it a little bit um but a, a lot of times i'm gonna have to try that right that is right. i've never even thought that because i'm one of those guys that just is always like underneath the armpit two hand strip real fast yeah. to get that fly in <laughs> but it's yeah. gonna be way yeah, easier if i don't have to strip right. it right but when uh when peanut bunker are around in the fall that's what a lot of what they're eating that and silver sides um if you if you're standing next to an albie bliss you see so many little peanut bunker just kind of dead fluttering in the current you know what i mean that's either either been whacked by an albie fin when they're swimming at 40 miles an hour um and they just absolutely crush bait balls and so the fish below it's also why a fish is sinking line um is because the fish below are um it's it's i've heard it's like an iceberg you know there's there's way more fish below than you see up top and they're kind of moving in a circle under there that's cool i haven't i've never even thought about the whole i've definitely done a slower strip and had luck with that um mm-hmm. and it, like it i don't know it's it it's it's different from a boat because it's like you can just write it off you don't have to think about it as much because yeah. it's like there's another school blowing up over here so we'll run over to that school but on foot right. i feel like you're really paying attention to like all right why did this not work what will work better this time so are you fishing typically yeah. pretty small flies for those because we're yeah. sometimes we're yeah. catching super small stuff so you're a little peanut bunker how big is a peanut bunker over there um, probably like an inch and a half. Okay. Maybe gotcha. a few inches. Er- earlier on, we'll get some big ones, but, um, most of the time I'm using, you know, an inch and a half to, to, to two inch gummy minnow or albie whore or, um, some of the, the foil flies, you know, with the, the, like the foil siding that are yeah. super reflective. That's cool. Yeah. Our, it's, again, I always, especially when I have guys on from way South of us or North of us, like we'll have, we have peanut bunker, but we'll, or We'll call them, you know, peanut pogies or pogies. Yeah. Um, and a small pogie here is like two and a half, three inches. And mm-hmm. then we have some, they call them shad. They're not actually shad, they're pogies. And we'll, right. they'll be like 12, 13 inch pogies that guys will fish yeah. for bluefins with. It's, it's, uh, it, yeah, it's just crazy. The yeah. numbers of those bait. I mean, those, uh, catching a, a 13 inch pogey on a spin rod would actually be pretty fun if you were targeting them right right <laughs> that's cool uh so do you spend your whole year there fishing do you have any travels do you go anywhere else and and target other fish typically um i i have you know covid has really like messed up travel the last few years and I've, I've shifted jobs a few times but um and i've shifted locations i in the in the last two years i've uh, I moved to oregon uh for a job and then back back to massachusetts so I was doing a lot of river fishing out out there. I was cool. in the bend, um, but I just I missed the ocean the whole time I was there. You know, was that the main and, uh, reason for the move back? Was just wanting to be back by the ocean? Yeah, yeah, and families on the east coast. Yeah, you know, and um, it's just yeah, I miss the seasons here of, of when the stripers and and all the other fish show up. It's just lights out for for six months, and then, um. And then it's just I just focus on work and and uh, other stuff in the in the winter time. Yeah. So there, 
is there any hobbies, any outlets in the wintertime up there in Cape Cod, or are you just staying warm? Uh, staying warm. We have awesome freshwater fishing. No one knows about it, really. It's just not really publicized. Yeah. But, um, I mean, you get eight, nine-pound largemouth caught here all the time. That's and, awesome. Uh, and they're, they're a lot of fun. Big smallies, too. Um, I mean, I arguably, I arguably catch more smallmouth and largemouth here than I did when I was in Georgia, just because we have so many ponds not just one you know big lake here and there but we've got like 300 ponds on the cape all of which have fish that's cool um, and and massachusetts has a, an insane uh trout stocking program really where they're, they're stock yeah they're stocking big fish every week um, that's awesome. which is pretty cool. and is that all in rivers or are they doing that in the ponds and lakes as well uh just in the ponds really we don't really have many rivers here gotcha 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 yeah. that's that's Not awesome it's a well, that's what if I, next time I come up there to see that cut, I'm gonna hit you up. We're gonna do some pond hopping one afternoon. Yeah. That sounds awesome, uh, yeah, and I definitely good. want to get up there and do some do some striper fishing. It's it's been a place. Yeah. The cool thing to me about about the Cape was just the accessibility to water, and like yeah. the ability to drive out on a beach. And we just don't have that down here. And I didn't think like with all the big houses and the money that you see up in Cape Cod, like you would think it would be a little more locked down and a little more rigid. But really, man, you can like we could drive our at least from what i saw and and talking to the guys at the tackle shop when we stopped in where you were it was just crazy the access for hunting and fishing up there it was really neat yeah so um i want to before we wrap this up give you the opportunity to kind of tell people how they can get up with you if they want to hop or want to go fishing with you if they want to reach out through the shop so if you want to and i'll, I'll include all yeah. this in the show notes in the description on youtube and everything but how can people reach reach out to you if they want to chit chat with you Awesome. Um, yeah, through my Instagram is a really good way. Um, that's you know probably my most uh, most common social media platform. Um, it's just Joe underscore Mangiafico, and uh, I respond to everybody. And um, yeah, if people want to respond to me. with me, I did respond to you. <laughs> and now we're doing the podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I also have that's my main platform for. I'm a custom knife maker, so I sell my knives on my Instagram. Um, and so you'll see, you know, don't be surprised if there's a lot of blades on, on my Instagram in addition to fish. Um, your knives, but, by yeah. the way, are awesome. Very cool knives. Thank you. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Um, but also I'm, uh, I'm the only fly fishing guide at the goose, but a lot of people, you know, surf fishing on the Cape for big stripers is, is pretty intimidating. And we have other guys that do surf casting trips too. Nice. Um, okay. And so, yeah, I'm happy to hook you up with them if uh, if you just want a, a surf a surf casting trip. Um, definitely. But yeah. Well, sweet man. Well, thank you so much for hopping on. We'll have, definitely have to stay in touch. Maybe get get yeah. back on with you in the fall when everything's kind of going off. The albies are around. It'll be fun fun time to yeah. to kind of chit chat and see what's what's happening. But man, thank you so much, Joe. Yeah. Again, like I said, you guys, I'm gonna link all that stuff below. Uh, thanks for checking out the podcast, and we will see you next week. Later. Thanks so much, man. I appreciate it. Great talking to you. Yeah, man. You as well.